probably the same people who are like, I don't need vaccines. <laughs> I think Jesus is gonna protect my body from all of the big problems out there. It's like, oh, yeehaw. What the hell is even that? Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze New Format. My name is Simon, I'm your host. What we're doing today, brand new segment, brand new show. I mean, a show within a show. This segment is called The Past is the Worst, and every week we'll look into a reason why the past is the worst, and you'll feel better about living in the future. Where, you know, there are diseases and stuff, but they're not as bad as the diseases in the past, and all that kind of sh Let's just jump in. Danny writes it, I read it. Sam, he's still here. The boys are still here. He's adding in those memes. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. Uh, history's most terrible people, the barefoot scientist. Yes, I am uh, actually barefoot right now. I mean, I'm wearing socks, but other than that, I have nothing on my feet. It's great. I got this underfloor heating in my office, so my feet are nice and toasty. Toasty! Imagine lying on your deathbed and coming to the tragic conclusion that the world might have been better off if you'd never been born. I'm sure most of us could get together a few comforting thoughts that would suggest that our time on Earth had enriched the lives of others. Yes. I'm always like, oh, I've made all these glorious YouTube videos that have made people so smart and comforted them in difficult times. <laughs> that cat you once tried to rescue. <clears throat> That cat you once tried to rescue from a tree, it wasn't really your fault that you lost your footing and dropped it. But what if you looked back at your life and figured out that your nutty, misguided beliefs and sheer arrogance were chiefly responsible for the deaths of tens of millions of people? Oh my god, what has this dude done? Tens of millions? That is like record numbers. I mean, it's not. Because the what, Second World War was 60 million? But still, that's that's going to put you up there, mate. You think about the serial killers that we do on... I've got another show called Casual Criminalist. It's like, if they get up into the 200s, it's like, good lord, you're like one of the worst ever. It's our league, and we run this, and we did it for the Bay, and we're going to do it again for the Bay. Uh -huh. But, step forward, today's candidate, the barefoot scientist, Trofim Lysenko. Hello, Trofim. Born in 1898 and growing up in poverty in what we now call Ukraine, and what we will soon probably call Russia. Holy sh**, Russia is going to invade Ukraine. That is so intense. <laughs> like, it, this is close. It's scary. The Russians have a reputation. I mean, the Soviets had a bit... You, you know what I'm getting at. My name is Viktor Reznov. And I will have my revenge. There are a few signs in Lysenko's early life that this son of a peasant family would be destined to take hold of Russian biology and something and give it all a good push backwards about half a century. Illiterate until the age of 13, Lysenko's future may have looked a little bleak were it not for the good old Russian Revolution, which liberated Lysenko from a life toiling away on the fields of some rich landowner. Tell you what, the Russian Revolution, though, and Ukraine. And then the Holodomor. Retrospect, I mean, you'd be like, fucking Russian Revolution, man, that was not good for us. Not good at all. It opens up the doors to an education in agricultural schools where he began pissing about, experimenting on different different methods of growing a few peas during the harsh Russian winter. And this proved to be quite useful as the Soviet Union would soon be in new need of a dire uh, as the Soviet Union would soon be di direly in need of a new agricultural superhero to sort out the sorry mess that had quickly developed following the Russian Civil War, which had stripped the countryside bare. After Joseph Stalin rose to power as the country's cheeky, fresh-faced, twirly-moustache dictator in 1924, <laughs> it's the only time I've heard Joseph Stalin described as cheery, <laughs> genocidal maniac, monster, cheery? <laughs> Hey, Stalin! Way, what's up, my friends? Off to the Gulag for you! Welcome to the Gulag. If you survive, you earn your freedom. He shrewdly implemented an agricultural collectivization program in which millions of workers were forced to labor on farms now run by the state rather than those rich landowners in the past. Danny, I get the feeling that there's quite a lot of sarcasm in this one. Shrewdly shrewdly. How many millions of people die? The idea didn't really pan out very well. Grain was hoarded by disgruntled comrades, land was lost, crops were destroyed, and famine had engulfed the Soviet Union by 1932. There was one man 
who is going to sort all of this out. Not Trofim Lysenko, though. He was a bloody idiot. The man I'm talking about was Nikolai Vavilov, and he was a globally celebrated agronomist. I'm going to have to know how to pronounce that word because it's going to come up more often, isn't it? Agronomist. Agronomist. I guess it's like an agriculture scientist. I feel like I should know this. Can't we just call him an agriculture scientist, Danny? Why do we have to complicate things with big brain words that I don't understand, Danny? <laughs> ah. A botanist and geneticist who would go down in history as the man who identified the centers of origin of plants. Okay, I don't know what that means either. <laughs> I'm so confused by science. Fuck you, science! Nikolai knew his shit. By the 1930s, he held key influential positions within the USSR in the fields of agriculture, science, and genetics. But the problem with Nikolai's proposals and strategies is that they were based on logic and reason and an understanding of genetics, and he knew it was going to take time to increase the yields of the farmland. Oh yeah, this this is the problem with Stalin, right? He's like, look, 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 we need it to happen. Sorry. Look, 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 we need to happen within next five years, or uh, you go gulag, yes? And he's like, yeah, but this isn't going to work. It's just not how science works. And he's like, you like Gulag? <laughs> you like idea of spending a long time in Gulag? You make science work. It's like, it's not how it works, Stalin, is it, mate? <laughs> Stalin was in a bit of a hurry and preferred the idea of an agronomist who could wave a magic wand and just make everything better overnight. Oh, this is where the dude, the, the, the bad dude's going to enter the picture, isn't he? He's going to be like, yeah, I can do that. I can do that for you. And the other guy's like, I've got a Nobel Prize. You can't do it. And he's like, shut the up and go to the gulag already, you dick. And that's why Nikolai was slowly phased out of the picture to be replaced by the barefoot scientist, so-called because of his impoverished roots and the perception that he uh, obtained results through great hardship and difficulty. Trofim Lysenko had first come to the attention of the national media in 1928 while he was working at a remote research station in Azerbaijan. Lysenko had apparently discovered that peas, wheat, and barley could all produce higher yields in cold weather if their seeds were first frozen in water before planting. He proudly named this discovery vernalization, overlooking the fact that some Russian farmers had been doing this for centuries without making a fuss about it and going to the papers. Yeah, but that had they really? That's kind of cool. Is this actually a real thing? It sounds like a superstition superstition thing. But it also sounds like something that could be totally real. But I get the feeling because of the day, today's topic, it's not going to be real at all. And this guy's going it, it, to... It's, it's going to go downhill from here, isn't it? We know it is. Millions of people are going to die. And if you want to go downhill, that's pretty, that's pretty far down. Lysenko conducted further experiments during the late 1920s and has alleged that many of them were faked to produce more desirable results. <laughs> this is the thing, so much is going to be faked when it's like you get results or you go to gulag. That's People are going to fake I'll be faking all the time. People will be like, Simon, how successful is Brain Blaze? And I'll be like, enormously successful. Everyone loves it. We changed the format because of love. <laughs> if, <laughs> please don't send me to the gulag. I'm going to meet you in the gulag. <laughs> But that didn't stop him from generating praise and acclaim in the state-run newspaper Pravda, who really went to town in hyping up this promising new agronomist who seemed destined to transform the desolate landscape. Don't trust the state-run newspaper. It's th th they're always, you know, they're always saying good things about the government and bad things about people who don't like the government. <laughs> it's the problem with that. Although then there's the BBC, which is somehow independent, but it's funded by TV licenses, which always struck me as weird. And then the, you're, you're like reading an article where the BBC sh on the BBC and you'll be like, what? <laughs> Why are you doing this? It's because it's somehow independent. <laughs> and it's like BBC massive child predator ring. And it's like, what? <laughs> Why? Why would you write this about yourself? I hate myself. Oh, I hate myself. And they're like, because we have journalistic integrity. And I'm like, well, <laughs> at least you have journalistic integrity. <laughs> Uh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I don't believe that high levels of the BBC disclaimer in disclaimer allegedly in my opinion I mean how much of that is proven? I don't know there were a lot of pedos at the BBC weren't there? I mean, what was that big guy? I don't want to name it in case I get it wrong <laughs> I once said a guy and, I, and then in the video edit, I'm just I'm just I, we didn't publish it fortunately But I'm looking up do I mean that guy? And I googled him, and it turns out, no, he's just a wholesome non-predator. And I was like, thank fuck, because otherwise that would have been a lawsuit. <laughs> Good lord. I'm gonna get in trouble one day. What an idiot! 
The Communist Party newspaper reckons that Lysenko is on the verge of turning barren fields of the Transcaucasus green in winter so that cattle will not perish from poor feeding and the peasant Turk will live through the winter without trembling for tomorrow. And this naturally caught the attention of Stalin, who felt that it was time to elevate this new peasant hero up the ranks. Lysenko himself believed firmly in the Communist Revolution and was a staunch supporter of Stalin, but he never actually was a member of the Communist Party. Uh, uh, Oh, he's like, where's your communist card? <laughs> Don't you love it? But he didn't need to be. Lysenko was well aware that the Communist Party had a tendency to glorify peasants and that the people were more likely to warm up to the idea of a simple non-political guy who was just trying to do the right thing for his comrades and grow a few peas. And he was right over the course of the 19th that, yeah, but I'd still be getting a communist card just in case. Look, if communism came to power and I couldn't, like, if communism came back, like where I live, I live in Prague in the Czech Republic, I'll be like, yeah, let's get the f*** out of here. <laughs> It's like this. The Russians, the Soviets, they've come back. <laughs> Linking it into the invasion of Ukraine, allegedly, at the beginning of this video. I'll be like, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I'm going back to the UK. <laughs> Please, let's go. Let's go, family. Get in the car. Get in the car. Run! Go! Get to the chopper! And uh, there's stories like a friend of mine um, who lives, who now lives here, he's an American, Czech American guy, and his parents now live in America. And they came here and we all went out for dinner and they were telling us how they escaped. Like they literally escaped from the uh, Czechoslovakia when the communists came. They drove their car to a border station and just f blasted that f through, then lived in like a refugee camp with my mate for like, I can't remember if it was a year or two years. And then there's up in fucking Vermont. And I'm like, what is that? That is crazy. I, I don't have any interesting my, my family's like yeah 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 we we that it was i mean i don't know i feel like my family's got quite an interesting history but like nothing on that but that's what i would be doing how do we get on this tangent i'm so lost today i'm all over the place this new format was supposed to be rain simon in don't let him go on too many crazy tangents put a tie on him that'll bring him under control it sounds like i've got management this is business brain simon talking to presenter brain simon it don't always connect very well and uh, so it's not worked, has it? <laughs> God damn it. That's it, mister. You just lost your brain privileges. I also bought Peter. <laughs> OGPP. And he was right. Over the course of the 1930s, the truly talented agronomist Nikolai Vavilov was pushed out of the picture as the largely incompetent idea stealer Lysenko rose to prominence and was eventually put in charge of the whole of Soviet agriculture. And the deep rooted problem here is that Lysenko's ideas became increasingly nutty over the years. Lysenko didn't want to just grow any old crops, he was determined to grow communist crops, the best of all crops. The field of genetics had been making rapid advances through the early 20th century as we first began to really understand how plants and animals have shared character have stable characteristics and fixed traits which are encoded as genes which are inherited by the next generation however lysenko believed that genetics was a reactionary and evil invention from the west which denied all capacity for change uh <laughs> okay no offense but it sounds like some fucking commie gobbledygook he essentially didn't believe in genetics, which is odd, as from 1940 onwards he held the position as director of the Institute of Genetics of the Russian Academy of Sciences for 25 years. I don't believe in YouTube. It doesn't exist. It's like, be a bit weird, wouldn't it? That's a bit like Richard Dawkins accepting, accepting the position of the Archbishop of Canterbury, which would be fun. That'd be kind of fun. Under the guidance of Lysenko, the Soviet Union would go on to denounce the science of genetics as a reactionary, bourgeois enterprise and a whore of capitalism. <laughs> Okay, mate. Whilst geneticists on both sides of the Iron Curtain would be labelled as fly lovers and human haters, a reference to how the silly old geneticists were so obsessed with experimenting on fruit flies that doing actual science like those idiots. <laughs> Obviously, you just freeze the bees, don't you? And that's fine. <laughs> you don't need genetics. Why would we need that at all? Lysenko had a better idea, which tied in neatly with the Marxist principle of materialism, in which the behaviors and responses of an individual are dictated entirely by their environment and situation, rather than their non-existent genetic code. Mate, how do you explain the fact that, like, I don't know, two people with giant noses have a kid, and the kid has a giant nose? How, how do you explain that? Or, I don't know, I don't know why I went to the example of giant noses. <laughs> like, it just came to mind. Uh, but, like, hair or baldness or all of this stuff, how do you explain those traits? Is it like, I don't know, I looked at my dad's bald head a lot when I was a kid and I ended up bald. <laughs> okay. I just, I didn't have a cleft chin when I was born. I just looked at my mum's cleft chin the whole time and then, whoop, 
That's what happens. That's all that was took. He reckons that he could educate all plants to bloom in winter or any time of year by exposing them to the right mix of conditions such as freezing cold winter and effectively training them to thrive during the most challenging of seasons. Furthermore, future generations of the plants would remember and inherit these characteristics without the need to mess about with more special treatment or training. According to this new theory of Lysenkoism, the offspring would always remember the environmental conditions and behavior patterns of its predecessors via the inheritance of acquired characteristics. This sounds so ridiculous to like modern ears, but the, I, wait, people thought it was ridiculous back then because they knew about genetics. They were like, we understand that. Like, We've known about it for a long time. There was that monk dude or whatever experimenting on like plants and he figured it out like hundreds of years before this, I think. Not a guarantee. The problem with the idea is that it's complete bollocks. It's a bit like saying if you cut off the trunk of an elephant, it will give birth to trunkless offspring. Or if you broke your leg from falling out of a tree during that failed cat rescue attempt, you'll produce a child with a broken leg and a hatred of stupid cats. Or that my own children would be born with chains attached to their ankles and a tattoo on their forehead which reads, Property of Simon Whistler. Well, at least we can try and work on that one. That would be a good one. Maybe we can, like, put that in the genetic code. You what? Lysenko's batty theories attracted scorn and ridicule throughout most of the rest of the world. One notable British biologist declared at the time, Lysenko is completely ignorant of the prince elementary principles of genetics and plant physiology. To talk to him is like trying to explain differential calculus to a man who does not know his 12 times table. However, Joseph Stalin was enthusiastic about the idea of growing fully trained and pimped up communist plants which would be ready to take on the russian winter within a relatively short period of time yeah me too and i'll be i'm enthusiastic about tons of shit. unfortunately none of it's real like i'm enthusiastic about magic magic would be tight i've read harry potter like just having a magical stick that can light up and cast spells and make food i'll be like this is great like what are you talking about i'd love that except it's not real is it joseph Come on. So he was perfectly happy to let Lysenko lead the motherland right up to the infertile guard up the infertile garden path in a catastrophic move, which would have wider consequences that stretched way beyond the Soviet Union. By the 1940s, Lysenko's influence had grown in almost exactly the same way as his plants definitely didn't. It appears that he was given free reign to do whatever he liked without the need for pesky red tape or control groups or statistics or Ah, wait for it. Why would he need this? Evidence? Ah! He was now insisting that farmers plant seeds very close together as he believed that plants from the same class would not compete with each other. He had forbidden... How, how can you be so stupid? Just plant plants together once and you'll see like, oh, they do compete with each other. Oh, it'd be like, yeah, humans. We def no what we we don't compete with each other. We all just go great in some giant symbiosis of joy. Except no, we're all competing all the fing time. It's just how we are. Plants are the same. Stupid plants. Stupid plants! <laughs> Sorry, that was an overreaction. Come back, Peter. Welcome back. Daddy chill. Yes. And he had forbidden the use of any fertilizers or pesticides and was beginning to make weird claims that inorganic substances could be mixed together to magically create life. What's that called? Where they used to put sh in a thing and think it could make a living being like a hamster or something? This was a thing in the past. They'd be like, yeah, put some urine in there. Yeah, put some sulfur. Yeah, a little bit of Pepsi. Put that in there. Shake it all up next week. It'll be a hamster. No. <laughs> it's got a name. It's got a weird name. <laughs> but more disturbingly, Lysenko's influence had grown so powerful that it became a crime to disagree with him. That's just good science. During one of his speeches in 1948, which had been edited by Stalin himself, Lysenko declared that Lysenkoism was now only official biology, the only official biology of the Soviet Union. Any proper scientist who dared to point out that Lysenko was clearly talking out of his ass had to face dire consequences. The more fortunate dissidents were simply dismissed from their posts and left in poverty, but it's also believed that thousands of scientists were rounded up by the secret police and left to fester in prisons or psychiatric hospitals. Many of them were executed as enemies of the state for their belief in the science of genetics. F 
Man, Stalin was such a dick. Like, I mean, I know he. It's not a controversial statement, but I mean, holy f communism. No wonder no one likes you. I mean, people like you. There are definitely like people who still love communism. And like, what the f going on? Like. <laughs> But this was like communism at its worst. Like, there's definitely bits I like about communism. Like, there's loads of stuff about communism I think is great. It's like equality, healthcare, social support, all of these things, like any good European loves. But I'm like, yeah, but it was also pretty f***ed up. Like, there was tons of, like, authoritarian sh which I guess isn't really communism. It's more just, like, dictator sh But, come on. This is stupid. Patrick, that's my money. Have you learned nothing about sharing? Remember that proper agronomist, Nikolai Vavilov? Of course we do. How could we forget that? Uh, considering that he was one of the greatest scientists of the 20th century, he really should have been at the top of the tree at this point, instead of the woefully incompetent Lysenko, who was just plucking his wacky ideas out of the air. Nikolai had actually encountered a very long, young Lysenko back in the early days, and had even encouraged his studies before eventually realizing with regret that he was actually an imbecile. Nikolai was arrested by the secret police while collecting plants and sentenced to death, along with two colleagues. No f***ing way. Oh, what a loser! Good! Good! More for me and you! His sentence was later commuted to life imprisonment, oh thank god. But his colleagues were executed. <laughs> Communist Russia, what the f***? Nikolai died in prison of starvation less than two years later. Maybe he wished he was executed. Starvation is not a way I would choose to go. Lysenko continued to be held as a hero, even when it became blindingly obvious that everything grown according to his silly methods had died or rotted away. At the, as the wheat and rye and potatoes and beets all withered, having failed to remember how exactly their predecessors had coped with the coals, portraits of Lysenko were still proudly on display in scientific institutes across the USSR, and a brass band would play a song written in his honor every time he gave a speech <laughs> it's like the evidence is right in front of you my dudes i'm stupid not lined carl of course stalin deserves quite a bit of the blame for the resulting famines of the 1930s which killed somewhere between 7 to 10 million of his own people but lysenko was the one who was largely guiding the way with his ridiculous pseudoscience which was extending the problem rather than curing it i i mean lysenko's a dick he's an incompetent he's an imbecile but it's not really his fault because if science and like merit was allowed to thrive in the Soviet Union, this would never have happened because everyone would be like, no, that guy's an idiot. Like consensus is, we know this, but because of just the way it's set up, he's allowed to thrive and do all of his crazy shit. This isn't on him, this is on the Soviets. Reports of cannibalism were rife in the 1930s, as the sight of people dropping dead from hunger in the streets became so common that it stopped attracting any attention. Holy shit, you know your society is fucked when it's like you're walking to work and it's like there's just people starving to death on the street, like literally dying. And you're like, yeah, pretty standard though, isn't it? Pretty standard. This is normal. Everything's fine. Along the way, Lysenko had ripped apart what he then considered to be the finest genetics community in the world, blocked access to fundamental science, and set back bi uh, Russian biology and agronomy by approximately 50 years while simultaneously condemning millions of, of his comrades to starvation. It can't get much worse than that, can it? Well, come on, this is Brain Blaze. Of course it can. Following the establishment of the People's Republic of China, oh god, more people are gonna die. Millions more people are gonna die. How many people died in the Chinese, uh, what was it called? The Agricultural Revolution? What was that called? The Great Leap Forward! Oh my god. So many more people are gonna die. Uh, People's Republic of China in 1949, Mao Zedong thought it would be a good idea to follow the shining example of those wise communists over at the Soviet Union. And this included copying wholesale the concepts of farm collectivization and Lysenkoism. So Lysenko can also be credited with inspiring the Great Chinese Famine, which saw peasants reduced to eating bird droppings and claimed somewhere between 30 to 45 million lives. Some would argue that Lysenko directly or indirectly killed more human beings than any other scientist who has ever f***ing lived. Dude. I mean indirectly. No one's saying directly. Did Danny say argue that Lysenko directly killed more human beings? That's just not true. He didn't directly kill anybody that we know of. 
that we know of. Uh, but he indirectly killed a lot of people. That's my credo. No regrets. Mm-hmm. Following Stalin's death in 1953, Lysenko's grip on power gradually weakened until it reached the point where he was officially discredited as a fraud in 1964. It only took most of his bloody career. As the Soviet Union, he could then do what, like, that Andrew Wakefield dickhead did. It's like, yeah, no, 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 you come up with some crazy theory about vaccines and autisms, get struck off the medical register in the UK so you can't be a doctor anymore, and then just go around the world talking your crazy shit and uh, getting rich from it. What a f***ed up world we live in, allegedly. I mean, he's, uh, just to be clear, it's not a statement of fact, it's just my opinion. I think he's a dick. You can think whatever you like about him. But he is, though, isn't he? He is. He is. I wonder how he killed... I wonder, like, when he goes down to hell or whatever, I wonder if they can tally up how many children he's responsible for the deaths of. That would be interesting. As the Soviet Union finally began to follow the lead of the US when it came to crop cultivation that wasn't rooted in voodoo, Lysenko quickly slipped into obscurity and later died in 1978. During one of his last sightings, the American science historian Lauren Graham bumped into him in a restaurant in Moscow where he was sitting alone at the back of the room. Lysenko explained to Lauren that he was eating alone because nobody else in the USSR would sit with him. Good. Why haven't you killed yourself out of shame? <laughs> Holy sh- all that was too far. Don't say that. Maybe we should feel a bit sorry for him, but at least he had been left with some food on his plate. Quite alarmingly, Lysenko's theories have been earning a revival in very recent years from new defenders of the belief that their true Russian hero was badly treated after he had the guts to stand up to science and the imperialism of the West. Who the f is thinking this? <laughs> Hello, monkeys! Probably the same people who are like, I don't need vaccines. <laughs> I think Jesus is going to protect my body from all of the big problems out there. It's like, oh, yeehaw. What the hell is even that? This is partly to do with the relatively new field of epigenetics, which proposes that in very specific cases, environmentally driven changes can be passed down from parent to child. Lysenko's supporters suggest this proves that the barefoot scientists have been right all along. Yes, but epigenetics is a very, very specific part. And it's like very limited application. But epigenetics is effectively the study of changes to genes, genes which, genes which Lysenko refused to even believe existed. Uh. And from what little we truly understand today about epigenetics, we do know that it bears no resemblance to Lysenko's theories, as epigenetic changes are incredibly rare, marginal, and temporary. There's nothing in there to suggest that you can educate plants and all of their future offspring to survive in any season by getting them to remember what their parents got up to back in the day. You hear that, Peter? You're a dumb plant forever. Ah, you're not even real. You're made of plastic. Very authentic looking, though. It's really quite impressively real looking. I don't know why I'm stroking him. That's a little gay. Hold on. But the revival of interest is perhaps just one part of a worrying wider. But the war. But. But the revival of interest is perhaps just one part of a worrying, wider issue in which a growing number of Russians are looking back to the Soviet era with feelings of nostalgia and admiration for the heroes of the old days who dared to stand up to the West. Uh oh! <laughs> wow, this is a this is a surprisingly topical episode, isn't it? A poll conducted in 2017 concluded that 47% of Russians approved of Joseph Stalin's character. And get this. No, I just read it ahead and I saw what it says. They admired his managerial skills. Where the f*** are up to you, Russia? 47%? What the f***? It's Stalin! It's f***ing Stalin! You do that same survey in Germany about Hitler, it's gonna be like... <laughs> Not many people are gonna be like, yeah, no, that was, was alright. <laughs> it's hard to go to understand. Daddy, chill. Wow, maybe there's hope for the glorious communist revolution yet. There's not. We might proclaim that the past was the worst, but clearly not everybody agrees with us. And now, introducing a new regular segment on Brain Blaze. We're making this a more segmented show, a more structured show, because honestly, the complete lack of structure, while, you know, has its charms in the previous version of Brain Blaze, little more structure never hurt anyone. Uh, that's a complete lie. Structure, I mean, that Stalin was probably quite structured. Those five-year plans are really structured. Sh** went bad. Collectivization was extremely structured. Not a good time. <laughs> 
And that segment is called We Should Have Listened to That Dude. The course of history is littered with smart cookies who could have changed the world. Take Ignaz Semmelweis, for example. This Hungarian doctor took up a position at Vienna's General Hospital Maternity Wards in 1846, during a time when many new mothers were dying after contracting the largely mysterious pure parole fever, more commonly known as childbed fever. But Ignaz noticed something quite curious. One of the maternity wards was staffed entirely by male doctors and medical students, while the other was staffed by entirely female midwives. And while the all-male ward was witnessing deaths between 13 to 18 percent of new mothers, one in ten to one in five. Good lord. I read that quote the, a quote the other day or an article or something, and it was like, you know, why do people live you know, someone, where was it? Maybe it's on Quora. I spent a lot of time on Quora for my sins, like trying to find like interesting topics or just procrastinating. And someone was like, how did this dude from like the 15th century live really long? And it was like, well, basically, if you survived like early child, if you'd survived early childhood and you weren't a woman because you could die in childbirth, you could actually live pretty long. It was just like the numbers were super shrunk down because everyone was dying as a kid, which is crazy. Well, that is very interesting. Please tell me more. Uh, where well, the figure dropped to 2% on the midwife ward. So what was causing the significant discrepancy? Ignis came across a vital clue when a male colleague suddenly dropped dead one day. The colleague had died from what appeared to be childbed fever after accidentally cutting himself with a scalpel during an autopsy on one of the many women victims. And the thing is, autopsies were only ever conducted on the side of the hospital staffed by the males. Ignis soon realized that the mortality, mortality rate was only higher on the male ward because they were dissecting infected cadavers with their bare hands one minute and then delivering a baby the next. Holy sh it's like, what are you doing? <laughs> Have those in different places and please wash your hands thoroughly. No. No, I don't think I will. All they needed to do was wash their grubby hands before sticking them up a woman's vagina. Ignaz began instructing his staff to wash their hands with chlorine before undertaking any new medical procedures, a revolutionary concept back in the day which would have helped to reduce the spread of disease and infection in any medical facility. And sure enough, those mortality figures in the male ward came tumbling right down. It'd be really disappointing if your like, mum or your wife had just died and then they'd be like, oh yeah, all we need to do is wash our hands. You know, for f**k's sake, you couldn't discover that a little bit earlier? Dick. But his colleagues weren't happy, particularly as they felt that they were fa facing accusations of being dirty bastards whose lack of basic hygiene had been responsible for the deaths of all the previous victims of childhood fever. Uh, that's exactly what they're saying, and scientifically, it's 100% accurate, you dirty bastards. As the, and the rest of the medical industry didn't agree with the findings of Ignaz and felt that washing your hands with chlorine was an unnecessary waste of time. So the practice was dropped for several years, during which many more patients died after being infected by the grimy hands of male doctors. Never mind, you know, I said, I wish they, you'd disco you know, I wish you'd discovered that a year earlier or whatever. Never mind, because they didn't do it anyway. And then you'd be like, you knew about this? You bellends! A furious Ignis lost his job at the hospital, his reputation, his credibility, and it would seem his mind. He was eventually consigned to a mental asylum in 1865 at the age of just 47, where he died just two years later. Although we don't know for sure, it's been suggested that he most likely died from an infected wound after the guards at the facility beat him up. <laughs> if only they'd washed their hands first. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Blah, 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 blah. But the what? But. Oh.